Okay, so um, so what, what I plan to do, I mean, during this hour or so, so I mean, give you a very general overview of, I mean, of the kind of studies we've been doing uh, over the past 20 plus years. I mean, sort of, I mean, on the recognition of compound rights. I mean, before starting my talk, I'd like to acknowledge two of my very close collaborators in this endeavor. Uh, Raymond Bedram, who is sitting behind there, so he's, he's present, and uh, he's a colleague from um, my university, um, from the speech language pathology, um, and then um, Alexander or Sandy Polacek from the retired professor from the uh, University of Massachusetts. So the, we've been sort of, I mean, three of us, we've been sort of, I mean, doing most of the studies that I, I go in some depth, I mean, in this, during my talk. So, um, so uh, I'd, I'd really like to acknowledge their contributions. I would not be here without their sort of, I mean, contribution to these, uh, these studies. Okay, so um, when we talk about uh, word recognition, visual word recognition, so the, the literature, is heavy, has been heavily focused on the recognition of four-letter words or sometimes even five-letter words. Uh, there's been, um, I, I recently talked to a colleague from uh, uh, Berlin, uh, Artur Jagobs. He said that he, he made his career, his, almost his total career in just recognizing four-letter words. But he has changed uh, gears now, and he's um, studying uh, the comprehension of uh, poems and literature. So he's uh, he got sick of I mean doing this kind of I mean work. So uh, the, the the modeling uh, of rec the recognition process is also heavily focused on these four-letter words. But I mean, as all of you know here in this audience, I mean, I mean. So many languages, in fact, I guess in most languages, the majority of the words are not four or five letter words, but they are more complex in terms of length and also structure. So, uh, uh, and one, one co common type of, I mean, word, a, co a co more complex word is, is compound word that comprises uh, two or more components or constituents, lexemes, that indiv individually carry a meaning. And that's, I mean, uh, what my, my talk will be all about this morning. So in many languages, com compound words sort of, con I mean, comprise the sort of the majority of the words in the dictionary. The, the language that we have studied most, I mean, in our case, is Finnish. And that sort of, I mean, if you look into the, uh, the Finnish dictionary, so something like 65% of all the existing words are compound words. So if you are to understand word recognition in Finnish or some other languages like that, you really have to know how to, I mean, how, how these types of words are recognized. In Chinese, the, the number is even greater. So that the two character compound words are more, I mean, there are more than 70% of all words are two character. Uh, uh, compound words. That's also the case in many Ger Germanic languages like uh, German, Dutch, Swedish, Norwegian. Uh, my understanding is um, I don't have any numbers for I mean Russian, but it's less so for Russian. So it's, uh, in Russian, I mean I don't know Russian, but I mean uh, understand that I mean the, 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 there there are less compound words in Russian. Okay, so. Uh, so the, the, the key question I mean, that I'm going to address this morning and that we have addressed in the, uh, the studies is sort of, I mean, I mean how, basically the how are compound word recognized, but I mean, I mean more precisely whether they are recognized as holistic units or via the, the component morphemes or lexemes. So that means so if you have a word like uh, I mean, English boathouse, so whether that would be recognized as, as, as such as such, or whether the recognition goes via the, the individual lexemes of I mean uh, boat and house, which are both more common sort of in the language than the, the compound word itself, typically. Yeah. So the, the, the compound the constituents are typically more common I and mean, more frequent than the the the, uh, the whole the word itself. 
Okay, but before uh, I go into the uh, studies in more detail, sort of a summary of the study, so I talk a little bit about the, the methodology that we've used. So first thing to acknowledge is that we, we've used a methodology introduced by Marcus Staft and Ken Forster a wh wh while back. And the, the idea here is sort of to manipulate the, the frequency of the, either of the individual components, individual lexemes, or the, the whole word, the, the whole compound word. And sort of the, the idea is sort of that in the, this way we can look into the, the sort of the, the uh, for the compositional versus holistic processing. So the evidence for compositional processing comes from uh, findings where the frequency of the components compound word constituents as separate words influences so, so the recognition speed. So if we get a um, constituent frequency effects, I mean, during the word recognition process, that would be evidence that, I mean, you are accessing the, the components, I mean, while doing the, uh, the, the identification of this word. Uh, on the other hand, for the, the evidence for holistic processing comes from the uh, uh, I mean, findings where the frequency of the whole word influences the recognition speed. But if it's, if it's going to be purely holistic processing, you would not get any effect, any reliable effect for the, 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 uh, the component frequencies. So that's sort of the, that's sort of the, sort of the, 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 the reasoning that we have adopted from Taft, Taft and Forster and sort of, I mean, and, and made use of in our studies. Okay, so more more about uh, methodology. So I um, mean, a lot of lot of studies and word recognition has, has used a, an isolated uh, word. I mean, a presentation paradigm. But I mean, as as we all know, we don't rec normally recognize words in isolation. But they are always I mean recognized as part of a, a bigger. I mean, a context. I mean, uh, so we we've always put these words into a sentence context and. People are to read these word, I mean, these sentences as as meaning. I mean, to, for for comprehension, and of course they are not. They don't know that we are particularly interested in particular words in in the in the sentence. So I mean, they are naive to the the uh, sort of the the exact purpose of our study. So um, and we have uh, used as our primary method eye tracking. So I mean and. That is an ideal measure to, I mean, to, I mean, to, to study word recognition for many reasons. Uh, first of all, when you, I mean, when you read, you you're naturally move your eyes through the text, as as you see in this picture here. So, uh, uh, if you haven't seen uh, eye movement recording, so I mean, maybe maybe many of you have, but I mean, just let me walk you through. I mean, so that, I mean, you understand what type of data we deal with. So here, these uh, blue dots are fixations, and there's a number attached to that. You, you don't see that, but anyhow, so it gives you the, the, the time of that fixation. And there's the sequence of fixations. You can see that, I mean, uh, how the, the reading goes here. I mean, this, this person is reading Finnish, a native um, speaker Finnish reading Finnish, and then you see that, I mean, they fixate basically every word. Sometimes uh, a word is, I mean, fixated twice, as is the case, for example, this uh, first word, Ostoskadulla, that means shopping street in Finnish. So, I mean, that's actually a compound word. So you see that there are two fixations on that word. And we use these fixation patterns and the, the fixation durations as an index of the, the ease of, of, of the recognition, of, of recognition. So, I mean, we, we use them sort of, I mean, we're not interested in eye, I mean, eye movements themselves, but as they sort of reflect the sort of the mental processes ongoing during reading, in our case, uh, recognizing compound words. So that's, uh, so I mean, so that's, the method taps into the time course of processing also. You can look at the, the first fixation duration, in, in this case here, um, sorry, this would be, this would be the first 
fixation on the word. So that's sort of the earlier processing, and then a little bit. I mean, and then you can t tap into a little bit uh, uh, later processing of that word by looking at the fixation of the, of the, the second fixation. So uh, taps into the time course of processing, but also what's that, what's what's uh, nice about the, the method is that, I mean, you don't need any extraneous task that, I mean, to, I mean, you don't have to press a button for, I mean, when you're ready to, I mean, when, when you recognize the word or something, you just read naturally and then you get all the data for free. So that's, I mean, that's why we've been using the method to study uh, uh, in our, to, to our study purposes. Okay. One more slide about the, the methodology. So um, we always, were in, in these experiments, we have put the, uh, the, uh, the word, the target word, the compound word, in a sentence context, as, as I already and, and I told you. And it was also always in the base form, no inflections added. So it was in the base form. So because, I mean, we wanted to be a sort of, I mean, um, not to co complicate things, I mean, any, any further. So, uh, so we, so, and then we manipulated, in, depending on the ex I mean, experiment, we manipulated the, uh, the, either the first constituent frequency or the second constituent, constituent frequency or the whole word frequency. But then we, I mean, having everything else under control. So, I mean, things that were not manipulated, they were controlled. And I mean, also the sentence context was, I mean, uh, controlled in the sense that, I mean, here's a study that was done um, in English um, where we looked at the sort of the effect of spacing in uh, uh, um, reading English uh, compound words. I mean, I'll come back to that. Let me study a little bit later. But I mean, but here you see that, I mean, what I mean, the typical sort of, I mean, situation where we have uh, a word, uh, the target word basketball or tennis ball uh, in, a con um, in a context that, I mean, I mean, so you see that it's exactly the same context. I mean, the, the prior context and also the following context is typically identical. It's only the, the only difference is the target word. Right. And I mean, uh, you, and also we, uh, we have used context where the the, uh, the, the, the preceding context up to the target word is neutral in the sense that it doesn't constrain, sort of predict the word. So if, if you say Gary found an old, it could be anything. So, I mean, so, in the, so, uh, so it doesn't sort of, I mean, it's, I mean, zero, zero predictability for the, so, I mean, yeah. So that was, okay, so the, the maybe enough for the, the methodology. Okay. Let's start going over the, uh, some, some results. Uh, and there'll be, there'll be a, lot of the, a lot of results, but I mean, uh, but um, of course I, I won't be able to, I mean, go through all the studies that we've done, but I'll, I'll give, I'll try to give you a sort of, I mean, summary of what we have done. So, uh, so the, the, the first two studies, uh, uh, what we found was, I mean, these are not actual, actual data, but, um, um, basically sort of conceptually presenting what we found. So uh, here uh, below it's something called gaze duration. And that's, I mean, the, um, this, uh, it's the sort of the sum of duration of fixations on the word before you fixate away from that. So if in, in, our, in my example, I had, I mean, this ostoscadola, there were two fixations on the word. So we just sum them up. And that, that would be the gaze duration. So it's basically the sort of the, what we also call first pass fixation time. And that sort of gives, I mean, that's maybe the best index of reading that word. So, I mean, recognizing that word. So typically that's sort of the measure that we use. Uh, but we use also first fixation duration, which is, I mean, the data are shown at the top. But what you see here, I mean, may, hopefully, but if you don't, so here, uh, is the first constituent frequency manipulation, second constituent frequency manipulation, the whole word frequency manipulation. You see that for gaze duration, you get all these effects reliable. All the effects come reliable. In the first fixation duration, you get, uh, for the uh, first constituent frequency, you do get an effect 
but not for the second. So the early effect is only for the first constituent frequency. A uh, little bit maybe something might be going on for the, the whole word frequency. Not much. I mean, in these, these uh, particular experiments. Okay. Okay, but, that, but these, these were the, I mean, uh, yeah, I understand that you won't be able to see the, the, uh, at the back, see, sort of, I mean, there's, I mean, a summary that I wrote, uh, I mean, a couple of years ago on these effects uh, of all the studies that were done using eye tracking to study, com I mean, compound word processing, not, I mean, excluding the sort of other studies, but this is, I mean, eye tracking studies in reading. So uh, what, uh, what uh, you may not see, but I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through. So then you have long compounds there, I mean, about seven studies, mostly done by us. There's one study uh, in English, but I mean, if you look at the, uh, the difference in uh, the frequency, the, sorry, the, the, the effect size for a first constituent frequency, it's a sizable effect. I mean, the overall effect is 66 milliseconds. The only study that didn't show it was, I mean, in uh, a study by Juhas in, in um, done in, uh, in English, but that, that, that she used, I mean, shorter compound words. And if you look at this, sort of the, data, the summary of the short compounds, that the, the, the length of the compound word will become clear in a, in, a, in a few moments, but you see that, I mean, it's much smaller. The effect of the first constituent frequency is much smaller for the, um, the short compounds than for long compounds. So it's, I mean, in the order of 22 milliseconds. And for example, here, um, uh, the finish, the only finish study that is here is as a, as a marginal effect. And actually, we, uh, so we, uh, there's not much. Uh, strong evidence that, I mean, that the, con the constituents would be perhaps uh, in operation in uh, 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 recognizing short compound words. Short meaning, uh, they're not, I mean, of course, compound words are not, never short. So they are nine, about nine, eight, seven, seven to eight, nine characters. Long ones are typically, I mean, the, the ones that we've studied are on average about, I mean, 13 characters, so, uh, or, or longer. Okay, um, what about the effect of second constituent frequency? So again, if you look, I mean, if, I'm not sure if, how much you see, but the, all these, I mean, five studies here at the bottom are done in English and with rather short compounds, so nine, nine, seven, Eight, eight to nine uh, characters long. They don't show. What one does show an effect, but the but the only the study that was being done with real really long long compound is the, the, the Finnish study, and we find a very healthy almost hundred millisecond uh, effect of second constituent frequency. Okay, and then finally uh, the effect of uh, Howard frequency. That's sort of the, uh, the, there are less studies of those, but I mean, over a hundred millisecond effect for long compounds, about 61 uh, uh, millisecond effect for the uh, short compounds. But here you see that the, uh, the whole word frequency effect is, is reliable, has, has been reliable in all the studies that, I mean, uh, we, uh, has, been, has been done so far. But I mean, again, so I mean, a little bit uh, bigger effect for the, the long ones, but anyhow, so also for the, for the short ones, it's, I mean, uh, 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 clearly reliable. Okay, so, uh, so how, do, how have we sort of, I mean, interpreted these, these pattern of results? So we have used, among other people, that uh, we're not the first ones uh, to, in, I mean, sort of introduce this dual root race model. But the idea is sort of, I mean, because we, as you saw, we found both, I mean, constituent frequency effect and we found sort of, I mean, whole word frequency effect. So it seems that these both, the holistic uh, uh, sort of, I mean, root and the, the compositional or decomposition root is in operation. So, so the idea is that they, they both are up in operation at, this, at, at once. 
And I mean, depending which one is faster, that's sort of the, the, the one that you use. And I mean, and we have, I mean, with Raymond and I, we have sort of, I mean, put, I mean, proposed a something called visual acuity uh, hypothesis. And the idea is that if we, if we, when you uh, read a long compound word, so when you fixate a long compound word, say 13, 14 letters, so I mean, the, la the, the last letters, when, when you have the first fixation, maybe toward the, the, the sort of the center of the word, so what you have clearly in your fovea, in the, where it, the, uh, the visual acuity is, is at, at its best, is the first constituent. So the, the, uh, the decomposition root gets a head start for the, uh, for the recognition process, sort of, I mean, so then it's easy to see the first constituent and that's what you, I mean, access first. And then, then a little bit later on, also the, I mean, in, uh, the whole word uh, root comes into play. Whereas with the short compounds, where I mean, where, where typically sort of seven to nine letters uh, long. So when you fixate the, the center of that word, so you have all the letters of that word in your foveal reach, within your foveal reach, meaning that you have sort of, I mean, uh, the, the, you have en enough visual acuity to recognize all the words. So then uh, the, the holistic root is sort of, I mean, favored. So that typically wins the race. Maybe not always, but I mean, sort of, it has sort of the advantage of doing that. And that's, I mean, why we, we don't get, I mean, Raymond and I, we don't get, I mean, uh, constituent frequency effects with a short compound. Some people might get uh, in some marginal effects, but I mean, yeah. So, but basically that's sort of the, the sort of the theorizing that we have sort of put forth for, understanding the, the, uh, the comprehension process. Um, so, so far I've talked about uh, and reading uh, words in alphabetic languages, but as I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, Chinese, the majority, the vast majority of the words are compound words and make sense and sort of, I mean, uh, would be very highly interesting to do this also in Chinese. And people have started doing this uh, in Chinese, and there are not that many studies done. Um, and I mean, I think we cannot really make uh, definite conclusions at this point about, I mean, how the uh, compound words I mean, recognized in Chinese, but I just present one study that, I mean, Sui Lei uh, has just submitted, where I mean, she and, and her colleague sort of, I mean, orthogonally manipulated in the same experiment, first constituent frequency and, and second constituent frequency, sorry, first character frequency, second character frequency. And she did that, I mean, in two separate experiments, in one where the compound words were rather high in frequency and another one where the compound words, sorry, the compound words were rather low in frequency. But the, the, uh, the overall pattern, I mean, the, she did not find, or they did not find any character frequency effects. Sort of, I mean, sort of, I mean, so it seems that, I mean, if, if this is going to be the truth of reading Compound words in Chinese, maybe, maybe not. We, we're not. We don't, don't. We don't know that yet. So I mean, so perhaps the the uh, the uh, re compound word recognition in Chinese is a holistic process. Process. So I mean, and that makes. I mean, from our sort of visual acuity principle that I just, I mean, uh, briefly mentioned, that ma makes would make a lot of sense because I mean the. They, even though the, uh, the Chinese characters are very visually very complex, they're also very compact. So when two character uh, uh, word, if when you I mean, fixate on that, definitely it's all in your foveal area. So then it's sort of the, at least from the visual point of view, it's possible to get every, uh, all the information in at once. So in that sense, I mean, it's sort of, I mean, um, it's not implausible 
to think that uh, maybe in Chinese the, pr the process is more holistic in nature. Okay, um, here's a, a processing tree that we, uh, for compound word recognition, maybe it's too, I mean, um, we don't have a pointer, I guess, uh, do we? No, okay. Okay, I'll, I'll use the... Uh, Okay. Oh, here's a clip. I think we have a clip. Yeah. Okay. I think Sylvia does. No, no, it's, here, it's fine. It's, I have a mouse here. Okay, so uh, this is uh, uh, summarizing something that I've said, but also introducing something else. I mean, namely the segmentation process. We're going to talk about the segmentation process in a morphological segmentation process in a minute. But anyhow, so the idea in this processing tree is okay, you have a compound word, if it's short, then it's more likely to be holistic processing. If it's uh, okay. I think you need to take the radian first. Yep. Oh, that should work. No. The mouse is fine. The mouse is fine. <laughs> it's the wrong button. Oh, the mouse is fine. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. okay. No worries. Okay, so uh, short word, holistic processing, long word, decomposition, oh, and then st you start with the accessing the first constituent, as I mentioned here. Okay, if the first, I mean the const first constituent is short, so then there will be an easy access of the first constituent. If it's if it's long, so then we have uh, if the first constituent is long. There you go. Okay. It works. Okay. Yeah, the, the top one. This one. Top one. Okay. Yep. Okay. Nice. So then uh, the. Uh, <laughs> well, okay. So then, then you need probably, I mean, uh, segmentation cues in order to sort of, I mean, segment out the first constituent from the rest of the, the word. So in the sense that, I mean, with short compound, short, sorry, short uh, first constituents. So that sort of mean you are with your eyes at the center of that. So there's no, I mean, segment really segmentation needed. You can you can see that easily. But I mean, if it's long, you you do need uh, sort of I mean um, um, some uh, some seg segmentation uh, cues might help this process. And that's what I, that's what I'm going to talk about next. Um, we have looked at I mean three different kinds of segmentation cues. Uh, one has to do with vowel harmony in Finnish, and then I'll talk about uh, a little bit later about hyphen and also spacing. I mean, uh, I mean uh, that what, what that uh, has been I mean used in, in English. I mean writing uh, compound words in uh, English. But first of all, uh, first about I mean the the um, the vowel quality. That's something that uh, uh, it's not only unique to the. The Finnish language also can be found in other, some other languages. I, I, if I'm not mistaken, so some Turkic languages might have this, this too. But I mean, uh, but there are several languages, not only the finno ugric language, that has this feature. But I mean, um, so what, what, what is vowel harmony? So, uh, so we have uh, in Finnish two types of vowels. I mean, uh, front vowels, uh, uh, u. So they're pronounced in the front part of the mouth. And then you have the back vowels, a, o, u, and they're pronounced more in the back. And I mean, and, and they, they cannot appear in the same lexeme. So you cannot have a front vowel and a back vowel in the same lexeme. And that's sort of the, sort of the, the vowel harmony. But if you have a compound word, and that, that sort of comp I mean, consists of two lexemes, then there might be disharmony or might be harmony across the... Uh, so, for example, here you have selkä ongelma, that's a back problem. So then, and, and here's the boundary, or the morphemic, morphemic boundary. So you see that there's a, there's a front vowel and a back vowel at the, the boundary. Whereas here, ryöstö yritys, it's like a robbery attempt. Now, and this is the boundary here with, uh, between ö and ü, and that's sort of, I mean, that's harmonious. 
So they, uh, they are sort of, I mean, uh, so the idea is that here it's sort of, I mean, clear, clearly, what, I mean, it shows very clearly where the boundary is, but here it's more obscured. And that's exactly what we find, I mean, sort of, I mean, when you uh, 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 recognize words that have a clear boundary, the, I mean, uh, sort of, vowel disharmony at the, the boundary, they are easier to process, they are much easier to process than these ones. And what I show here is sort of the, the, the estimated effect size of the, the vowel harmony effect, uh, and that these are the fixations on the word, first fixation, second, third, fourth, you see that sometimes they might make even four fixations, even, even five on these words. But I mean, but what you see here is that the, the effect starts to emerge in the second fixation on the word, but it's, it's at, at its largest, the third fixation on the word. So it's not a very early effect, but I mean, still, I mean, sort of, I mean, has a very, sort of, I mean, this vowel harmony has a clear effect and sort of, I mean, and, and used to uh, segment, morphologically segment words, at least in Finnish. Okay, but then there's also, I mean, more, even more salient, visually salient, I mean, uh, way of uh, uh, sort of, I mean, point, uh, cueing and showing the, uh, the, the morphine boundary, and that's, that's done with a, hyphen, with a hyphen. So, uh, again, this is, uh, uh, we, we uh, compared so so-called concatenated compound words where there was no hyphen, like potilas huone is a um, patient room, vaihto-ohjelma, exchange program. But I mean, here you have to have a hyphen in Finnish when you have the same vowel at the vowel, I mean, the, the morphine boundary, you have to use a vowel, so that, I mean, sorry, a hyphen. So they are legally hyphenated. So we looked for the kind of words that are, have a hyphen. And then we looked at the sort of the processing of such words, uh, again, for long compounds and for short compounds. Uh, and uh, the idea was, uh, was the, the prediction was that, okay, if long compounds are recognized via the decomposition route, so then, uh, having a clear boundary, sorry, the boundary cue would help. But I mean, for short ones, it could be harmful because it sort of encourages you to go via the components, but you could actually easy, it, it would be easier for you to read that as a I mean, one, one whole unit. And that's exactly what we found. So that the, we found that the, uh, it's, I mean, the hyphen is facilitative for long compound words and detrimental for short compound words. So uh, here are the data, but I mean, uh, uh, maybe, maybe no need to go through the, the, the numbers here, but I mean, basically the idea is sort of like, I mean, it's, more, it's further proof for the sort of the, even for a uh, qualitative difference, at least in Finnish, in reading uh, short and long compound words. And it's con completely consistent with our, our visual acuity principle. Okay. Then uh, Raymond uh, and, and colleagues did a study on three constituent compounds. And that those are, they are not uncommon in many languages. So that you have, uh, uh, and, and this study was done uh, both in uh, Finnish and in Dutch. And you have, uh, and now we introduced again an hyphen, but now the hyphen was illegal in both languages. They are, these words were, should not be hyphenated. So that was sort of, but we, we put the hyphen uh, in two possible locations. So the, the two, there are two types of structures for three, three, three constituent compounds. So, I mean, for, I mean, one example would be Sali Jalkapallo, which is, I mean, literally, so gym football. So it it's, uh, refers to futsal or indoor football. And that's sort of, I mean, in Dutch, it's, I mean, how, how do you pronounce this? South fo football. South football, yeah. Same thing, yeah. So anyhow, so I mean, so we have basically two types of structures with, I mean, the three, uh, three constituent compounds. You have 
the see the first two the first two uh, comp, uh, constituents modifying the third one so this is the modifier that's the head or you can have the c1 modifying the the, the, the last two and this this particular one the sali alcapallo is uh, is this type so it's I mean, what's what, what's called the right branching and if you put the bar, the hyphen here, that's sort of, I mean, uh, is sort of where the, the, the real boundary is. I mean, for I me, mean, this is, because I mean, here, I mean, uh, if you put it here, that's a, a better way to do that because then this one is, then uh, this one is modifier and that's the sort of the, the head. But if you do it this, like this, sali jalka and pallo, so it's like, like uh, dream, dream food ball. So that's sort of like, I mean, uh, and that's a bit wrong way. That sort of, I mean, uh, sort of, I mean, uh, introduces a wrong parse to the, to the word. And that's exactly what basically if what we found was that, I mean, uh, again, maybe not uh, need to go through the, uh, all the data, but I mean, so, uh, so the, uh, the hyphen was harmful when it sort of, in, I mean, signaled a misparse of the, the structure of the compound word. Okay. And now we come back to the, the study I briefly mentioned uh, earlier. Where, so the, this has to do with uh, reading English compound words. And as, as, you have, uh, already, as I already mentioned, in English you can uh, write compound words unspaced or with, I mean, or with a space between the constituents. So spacing is a very visually salient uh, sort of, I mean, cue to the uh, to the, um, um, the, uh, the morphine boundary. So, for example, that you can have, like I, I show show you. So, I mean, basketball is written unspaced, but tennis ball there's a space between. So, there's no no exact rules how you should write words, the compound words in English. Sometimes there's there's a space. Sometimes there isn't, and sometimes there can even be a hyphen there. Okay, but what we did with Barbara Juhas and, 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 and colleagues was we used something called gaze contingent display change paradigm. You'll hear more about that. I mean, per, paradigm. A little, I mean, uh, later in this in this uh, uh, conference. But very briefly, so uh, you change some letters. Uh, in our case, we changed the last letters of these initially. So these were sort of, I mean, uh, replaced with, I mean, uh, random letters so that the, uh, the, uh, the whole word was not, I mean, readily, it, it was sort of, I mean, it was basically garbage. But I mean, and then there was a boundary, sort of an I mean, invisible boundary between, between the sort of the two constituents and when the, uh, the readers fixated from here, made the eye movement from here to here, so then uh, we changed the, the last letters to be the, the correct ones. So we used something called saccadic suppression. Uh, uh, so that, I mean, if you do that during the saccade, uh, you won't see the change. But the idea was to see what, how much of the information the readers took from uh, the, the second part while they were fixating on the first part as a function of where there was a space or where there, there isn't a space between the words. And what you see here is something called subgaze after change, so after the, the boundary change. So, uh, so you, uh, uh, and there's the, the, uh, the uh, sort of the uh, display change effect is much larger for the unspaced compounds than spaced compounds. So uh, it means that you attend more strongly if it's, the, if it's a visually sort of, I mean, uh, spatially and visually unified letter cluster like the unspaced compound words, you pay more attention to the whole. So you try holistic processing even though you don't necessarily sort of, I mean, achieve that. But if there's a space between them, so you're more likely to go via the components. So that's sort of, it's sort of, it, so I mean, attracts more co componential processing. Okay.
I'm doing okay with, with the time, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, fine. Yeah. Okay. What about uh, meaning computation for uh, compound words? So, I mean, it's not only that we have to lexically identify the, lex the, the components and the word, but we, of course we have to sort of come to the meaning of that word, what, what, it mean, what the combination means. Uh, so uh, there's, there, are, there aren't that many studies being done on this, but I mean, uh, but the, the evidence so far suggests that for, with existing compounds, the, uh, we get, I mean, uh, constituent frequency effects of similar size uh, for semantically transparent or semantically opaque compound work. So semantic tr transparent would be like cookbook, for example. So a book for cooking. But I mean, then you have semantically opaque uh, in English, maybe uh, something that frequently used is jailbird. So jail and bird have nothing to do with the, 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 the real the meaning of the word. So, uh, so um, you have to know what, what it means, but I mean, uh, so uh, that's semantically uh, non-transparent, opaque. But I mean, nevertheless, I mean, the, in the few studies that exist, I mean, you get, I mean, uh, constituent frequency uh, of, of, of similar kind for, for these. So, I mean, uh, so uh, it seems that I mean, the, the meaning is, uh, is accessed rather than computed for existing compounds. But with novel compounds, uh, again, only very few studies exist. I mean, so meaning, okay, it has to be computed because they're novel. It, it's, there's no other way to, to, to get to the meaning than to compute from the components. So you get a strong novelty effect. So the novel compound words, of course, I mean, uh, and produce lot longer fixation times than existing compounds, but also the constituent frequency effect tends to be much bigger, uh, at least in the studies that we've we've done. Okay. Um, I've, uh, I've all briefly mentioned about the uh, the structure of compound words, but I haven't talked much about that. But there may be just a few. Uh, uh, words about that. So I mean, the the, the study the studies that I've um, talked about so far, all of them have looked at two constituent compounds that conform to a modifier head structure, and that's basically all we have in Finnish, for example, and in many other languages. Sort of, I mean, sort of the the modifier head structure is the only one. But I mean, uh, I don't know French, but I do know that I mean, uh, you may have in French, you might also have the uh, sort of the, um, uh, the the head can be the first component and followed by the modifier, but you can also have have it the other way around. But I don't know any any study, at least I moment study that has looked at the that except one that I mentioned in, in a moment. But we also told you about the sort of, I mean, if, if, if the words get more complex, like, like the three constituent compound words, so then you have the, the, the two possible structures, sort of the left, left branching, so-called left branching and right branching, where the, I mean, uh, uh, where actually I, I already talked about, so the, the S, S, C, C1, C2 uh, modifies C3 or C1, modifies three, uh, C2 three, uh, uh, and, and uh, C3. But I mean, there's also, I mean, uh, we'll talk, when we talk about modifier head compounds, there's all, always, I mean, the, the modifier is bound to the, to the head via some kind of thematic relation. So if we take an uh, example from English, so I mean, snowball. So, so it's, a, it's a ball made of snow, so it has a made of relation. But I mean, snow tire is not a tire made of snow, but it's, I mean, a, a, a tire for snow. And, and sort of, I mean, to, I mean to, uh, to ride on snow conditions, that what you have to do in, uh, I'm not sure about St. Petersburg, but we have to change our, I mean, cars, uh, our um, tires in the cars, cars to, to winter tires, snow tires, I mean, and, so that has to, it has to be done. 
uh, every winter. So, uh, okay, but anyhow, so, um, so uh, there are many different kinds of I mean, thematic relations. I mean, I mean Schopen has found uh, 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 14 different uh, thematic relations for English compound words. But, I mean, this is something that, I mean, uh, to my knowledge, has not been sort of addressed, at least, I mean, uh, in, in the studies, I mean, the kind of studies that we have, I've been talking about. There's been some priming studies on this by Christine uh, Gagne uh, for, for English. Chinese is interesting. They have basically three, sorry, five different type of I mean, compound word structures. Uh, the, uh, the one that is maybe the most uh, common is called subordinate. It's basically the same. It's the same. The, the modifier head that I mean, we also we we, talk, we talked about. There's also coordinative. There's I mean, something called coordinative. I talked about that a little bit. Uh, verb object, subject predicate, and supplement. So I mean, um, and the the coordinative one is kind of interesting. Uh, so it's um, it's something like uh, I'm like I'm making this up. I'm, I should have checked if this is real Chinese. But I mean, okay, let's. I mean, I, I make a Chinese word. So um, you have uh, sky and moon. Sorry, star and moon. Okay, if you have word like I mean compound word star moon, it might sort of refer to a night sky. Okay. So meaning that, I mean, and star and moon sort of, I mean, are sort of equally, so they, they contribute, contribute equally to the meaning of the word. So, I mean, so there is no sort of that the one is modifying the other, but they, they have sort of equal status. And that's sort of like the, the co coordinative, and that's sort of, they're quite common in Chinese. Uh, as I already mentioned, there's, I mean, the structure and this thematic relations have not been, I mean, studied, I mean, in reading. Uh, uh, but there's one study that I know of, and that's, I mean, by Albrecht Inhof in, on uh, English. And that's sort of, I mean, they looked at what they call the headed compounds and, and, and tailed compounds. The, uh, there are some compounds where they, I mean, that I mean, corresponding to the, the I mean, the French structure where, where the, the head is, I mean, a, uh, in the beginning, like humankind, versus I mean, the handbook would be sort of the sort of the the, the normal the modifier head type that are more common. But what they found was simply, I mean, uh, and this is the only study. I mean, they they've done um, this is the only study that has looked at that, to my knowledge, at least in with respect to eye tracking. So what they found was that the, the meaning defining lexemes displayed a larger frequency effect than the, the, than the nominal, non-dominant lexemes. So I mean, so, uh, but that, th this is something that, I mean, maybe the, the effects of I mean, the compound word structure should be studied in more detail of, uh, in languages where this is uh, possible. Um, there's one, uh, I'll just mention a uh, one study by, uh, again, Sui Lei and colleagues where she looked that this is not an eye tracking study. There's a priming study where she uh, primed uh, subordinate, this is the modifier head, co I mean, uh, compounds and coordinative compounds. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, with the different structure or the same structure. So the uh, so the, the prime was, I mean, of the identical structure or different structure. And then uh, it was, they, they either preserved the first uh, constituent or the second constituent. And as you see, the, there is a priming effect for the same structure for the subordinate compounds. But the, the, the pattern of data for the coordinative is not as clear. I mean, so, I mean, maybe, maybe uh, there's, I mean, this is of course not nothing definite, but I mean, I'm just showing you that they mean this might be uh, a interesting uh, further avenue for for studying um, compound recognition. Okay, summary. So um, most of the uh, the observed results that I've I mean uh, gone through can be ex explained by the dual room race model. That I, I mean, I explained combined with uh, the visual acuity principle that also explained.
Also, you should bear in mind that the bulk of the existing evidence is based on two constituent modifier head compounds. So, uh, so possible future directions. Uh, so the, the issue of segmentation is, is, is non-trivial in reading, particularly if you talk, I mean, we uh, talk about uh, reading Chinese where all the characters are just, I mean, there's no spaces between them and the segmentation process is really uh, is, is an issue. But of course, when, when, it, when the word compound words in alphabetic languages are, I mean, um, also more complex, like three constituent compounds and even more four constituent compounds. They are, they are not uncommon in Finnish or German or Swedish. I mean, there, there are lots of four constituent compounds. Nobody has really studied how they, they can be uh, sort of, I mean, read and recognized. So there's a lot more to do, I mean, in, the, in that area. And also, the, uh, what about the, what processing principles are used to determine structural and thematic relations? between um, compound word constituents. That's, as I already mentioned, that's also uh, not much studied. Okay. Spasiba. Kiitos. All right. Um, we have plenty of time for questions. I'm sure you have many. Yuri, uh, go first. Yeah, thanks so much for this. This is fascinating. Thank you. Uh, well, with respect to questions, I'd, I'd like to perhaps my point that you're studying, what you're showing is about not processing compounds, but about reading compounds. Mm. Would you agree with that? That's that uh, mine is about to reading from yeah, reading. I want to tell you about the actual processing of compounds, for instance, when you have short versus long effects, mm. you make assumptions of this being a sign of holistic process, a decompositional group uh, processing. Mm. Is that really so? Is that that we it's just these duration, for instance, tells you something about what it takes? What what comes what goes on after after, after that? After okay, what right, right, yeah, yeah. So the, it, yeah, as as I said, I mean the um, so it has to be uh, has to do with the sort of accessing the sort of the uh, the, the the visual representation and sort of I mean also sort of I mean but also sort of I mean linking that to the mental representations you have that I mean so in that sense it sort of I mean you, the recognition in the recognition process you have you have the the visual input and then you have something that I mean you have a cor something corresponding representations in the in in your mental lexicon and then that that they, they, they need to sort of I mean uh, put so put in contact. Do, 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 I, do we study that in that this way? Yeah, I think so. I, I, that's my... Uh, that, what, but you think, other, you think that it's not the case? Well, so, I, think, I think that you only see what you show is what you do here in reading the compound, yeah. but not, it's not necessarily what happens for the processing, for the access, for instance, of semantics. Of, of oh, the semantics. Yeah, 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 right, right. As I said, I mean, already, I mean, I, I think this sort of, I mean, what I said about the lack of, I mean, evidence for the, I mean, how do you, I mean, uh, the, like the, the thematic relations, I mean, so how, I mean, uh, whether, I mean, how, uh, so the, we, we don't know anything about that, and sort of, I mean, also the, the semantic aspect is sort of, I mean, I mean, very little study, so I'm, I'm, I'm uh, yeah, it's true that, I mean, so it's sort of like, I mean, um, so uh, how, exactly, what, what, what type of semantic uh, representation, uh, interpretation they give to that word. So it's, I mean, um, th this isn't really telling so much about that. So yeah, that's true. I except that, I mean, the, for, the, uh, for the existing compound, at least what, I mean, our studies show that, I mean, the access process seems to be, I mean, similar for the semantically opaque and semantically transparent, but I mean, but again, it's not, yeah. When we do the full and we don't get the same thing. We, uh -huh. we find that the authority uh, of page one seems to be processed in full form, for instance. As, as, as full form, for instance. Full form, for instance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. But that makes, of course, I mean, when we, we did that, so we, that was something that we, I mean, uh, suspected to find too. I mean, w wouldn't be surprised, but I mean, but that didn't seem to be, seem to be the case. But yeah, 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 yeah. So it's me. So thank you, Jukka. It's wonderful. I'm from Helsinki to, to hear what is happening in Turku. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful presentation. So, 
So we have been actually studied quite a bit of naturalistic speech. I mean, so for example, compared to the brain activity related to listening to a narrative, one narrative, one hour narrative, and also then so reading exactly the same narrative. And so if you do fMRI, so then you see that actually the so patterns of activation in the brain are pretty similar, amazing similar. So then, of course, this is related to Yuri's question. So, so how, what happens when you, when you use auditory speech, narratives, and do the same tricks? I'm sure that people have played with that. And I would mm. predict that so the effects are pretty similar. But so what do we know about that? Uh, I'm afraid I don't know anything about that. <laughs> Myself, I, I mean, I, of course, I mean, there, there, has, there must have been studies on auditory, sort of, I mean, right recognition, there, there are, but I mean, I, I, I don't know, I mean, I cannot say, yeah, of course, it's sort of, I mean, um, first thing, you cannot use eye tracking for that, I mean, so sort of, you, you cannot, it, sort of, at least you have to have some other, other tools, and it's also more linear in the sense that, sort of, the, I mean, um, in the sense that you, you cannot access, I mean, if, if visual, in a visual presentation, you basically you can access the the the, uh, the whole word at once. Or you can you can get all the letters in if they are in your fovea. So the, all the all the information gets into the into the brain at once. But I mean, auditory. So that you start with the uh, it's linear. I mean, linear sort of. I mean, uh, presentation. So I don't know how. That affects. I mean, I'm, I'm not. I'm sure there's somebody in the audience who can. Get, Raymond, can you can you come? Up, I mean, if, yeah. so I would kind of yeah. expect similarities and, and dissimilarities. Yeah, yeah, okay. definitely. There's. I mean, yeah, yeah. But I don't. I mean, I'm. I'm yeah, that's a, it's a very good question. But I mean, I'm, unfortunately, I can't say anything uh, inter intelligent to this. But uh, Raymond, can can you think of anything? But I think it would be more, even more so. I think because it's sort of linearity. So I mean, yeah. the currency sort of the compositional processing. Yeah, yeah. yeah that was, I, th I would. Then for, uh, re with respect to visual, yeah. yeah, that's that would be sort of I mean, at least I mean uh, consistent with uh, what, what I said. Yeah. Can I, can I talk to you about predictability effects? I mean, it seems to me that in, um, I mean, all, all these studies have nicely controlled for the prior context, mm. right? And they're not, the, the, the upcoming word isn't predictable, let's say. But when you have something like basketball, mm -hmm. when you've got the first constituent in its basket and you mm. know that there's no space between the words, you're, you can be pretty confident that the next word is going to be the next pass is going to be ball. On the other hand, when you get tennis, right, mm -hmm. and you've got a space, it could be tennis court, tennis player, all mm -hmm. sorts of things. So the predictability seems to mm -hmm. me to be quite different in these different right, cases. Right, yeah. And since these have such large effects on processing, yeah. I mean, what, you know, what's, what's the effect of that in terms of how you, how you interpret these results? Um. Raymond has, you've done studies with uh, Victor Cooperman on this. Yeah, and, uh, I can't remember the, the exact sort of, I mean, results, but this is, that has to do with the, like, uh, the neighborhood, sort of a morphological sort of, I mean, uh, sort of how many, with how many uh, other words, I mean, the first constituent combines with. And yeah, that's, so that's, yeah. that's what they call family size. Family and size, uh, and yeah. so we, we have been doing experiments with, with the compounds of uh, family size, you could say, and that does, does certainly have an effect. So the bigger your uh, family, so to say, the more uh, unpredictable, of course, the uh, second constituent is. And then that, 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 that is sort of then taking, taking longer time. But I think in most studies, we have been matching our uh, uh, conditions for family size. So that, that is then something that cannot explain the results that Yuka was reporting here. Mm. Yeah. yeah, but that, that's definitely, I mean, the issue, I mean, a factor that plays a big role, yeah. Okay, um, let's see, one, two, Max, one more questions. I don't, I just had a question about, um, obviously you're doing, doing written language here, um, and I was just wondering what the implications were for spoken language, particularly in, in uh, relation to compositionality. 
as a, my work is in language evolution, and as I'm sure you know, one of the the aspect, one of the factors of um, one of the features rather of uh, spoken language argument by many researchers is in the difference between spoken language between of, of that humans have and the. Uh, the rather rich communicative repertoire, let's say, of other animals is the uh, feature of compositionality. And some researchers argue that compositionality is something that humans are able to do and that, it, that there's other animals not able to do. And I was just wondering whether, uh, how your research might impact upon that. <laughs> I have a very broad question. Oh, that's a difficult one, yeah. I'm not sure if I can relate to that in, 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 in any, anyway. Maybe, maybe uh, I'm not sure if I completely understood your question either, but maybe at the coffee break, I mean, uh, I, I, I'd, like to, <laughs> I'd like to hear more about that idea. So, um, um, but I'm not sure if I can relate to that. I mean, even after that, so, but uh, we'll see. Yeah. I think that was a very salient boundary cue, was the <laughs> coffee break. Okay, on that nice note, let's uh, say thank you. Thank you.